Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. My name is Eric McLaughlin. I am the astronomer here. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is black holes, but uh, before we do, I want to make a couple of notes. Uh, first and foremost, this and almost all of our programming is provided through our Library and Observatory Foundation. And that foundation is funded by people like yourselves, and so uh, you can thank th that foundation for making these types of events possible. Now, uh, that said, we're going to jump right in. And what we're talking about here, we're talking about black holes, and they're very, very interesting and complicated things. But uh, let's try and start at the beginning, as it were. Notably, when it comes to the idea of black holes, that idea has been around for some time. It has actually been around since before we knew about uh, general and special relativity, which is very crucial for understanding them. But uh, all the way back in the 1700s, a guy by the name of John Mitchell actually po posed this question of what would it take to actually have an object that is actually uh, able to have an escape velocity that exceeds that of light? Now, okay, that's a lot of loaded things there to actually understand. Well, the answer up to that question, though, is that you would have an object, if it was the same density as the sun, it would have to be about 500 times the diameter of the sun. Okay, again, let's try to understand what that actually means. What it means is, well, let's start with escape velocity. Escape velocity is basically this idea of having a re relative speed, a minimum relative speed, with which to actually escape the gravitational pull of another object. Now, if that escape velocity is actually to exceed the speed of light, and comparing the escape velocity of the Earth here at 11, uh, or 11.2 kilometers per second to the speed of light, which is around 3 times 10 to, the five, 10 to the 5th kilometers per second, that's a notable difference, you might say. In fact, again, it's a matter of about a factor of uh, 10,000 difference. <clears throat> so uh, if you have a speed that, or a, an escape velocity that is actually at the speed of light, well, what it would actually be is you'd have an object where light itself would not, necessar not necessarily pass, move fast enough to escape that object. And this is the basic idea of a black hole, that light itself cannot escape from its surface. This dated all the way back to the 1700s, but it was, it was notable because, well, yeah, that, that's it. Okay, that's what, well, we're done. Bye. No. No, that's actually not sufficient to really describe things, especially since our understanding of light at the time was notably very different. Our understanding at that point noted that light itself was, yeah, well, actually shortly thereafter, they understood it only as a wave, not in its full particle wave duality. And seeing it as a wave, the question then arises, well, will light even be affected by gravity? It's not a particle, it's not matter. Why would it get pulled towards matter? Because gravity seems to be related only to mass. So why would it be influenced by gravity? So that idea sort of was put by the wayside for hundreds of years uh, until you have Albert Einstein and his ideas of particle wave duality, that is seeing light as photons, as particles, but also acting as waves, very Interesting and uh, weird stuff, but it gets even weirder when you actually talk about general relativity. But the overall result of all that is that gravity actually distorts space-time, so it doesn't matter that light is actually massless. It'll actually be distorted as it passes through any curvature of space-time. Add to that a whole bunch of work by Schwarzschild, Chandrasekhar, and Oppenheimer, and a whole bunch of other people continuing on to this day, and we have a very interesting theory that, or a set of theories that really helps describe what black holes are. So, okay, let's actually take some steps towards that. And uh, actually, uh, Pablo, if you can bring the mic volume down just a little bit, we're getting a little bit of feedback up here. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and actually take a look at where we are here. Here in the solar system, one question that's often thought of is what would happen if you actually replace the sun with a black hole, and how does, and We'll use that as our way of answering the question of how a black hole impacts the space around it. So one thought is often that black holes will completely consume everything around them. They are a voracious vacuum that sucks in everything. Well, is that actually true? Well, let's instantaneously replace the sun with a black hole of equal mass. Uh, but it's notable that when the way a black hole works is it actually works just like any other massive object. It exerts a gravitational force. So, if we actually replace, a, uh, replace the sun with a black hole of equal mass, well, the 
curvature of space-time will not be any different than it currently is for the majority of the solar system. The only place it would really differ is in the area that would actually normally be inside the radius of the sun. So, what do we actually end up with? Well, we actually end up with objects in the solar system basically behaving just as they were before, but it gets different because now that we have a black hole sun, we do not have a good source of light. And now with no source of light, the entire solar system goes dark. And with that, we would actually have this situation where the entire world and everything in it would freeze. So yes, it's very uh, dramatic and uh, this is one reason why you shouldn't do that because it's a good way to let out your inner supervillain. So don't want to be doing that. All right. So you don't end up with anything but a cold solar system if you replace the sun with a black hole. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk more about black holes themselves then. One important thing to look at is the event horizon, and that's a loaded word. It's thrown about and often talked about in certain ways, but it's worth actually trying to describe what that word literally means. It actually comes from a very specific set of definitions. In general, we like to talk about places, that is, points in space. In mathematical terms, you can typically define it with three different coordinates, such as uh, x, y, and z would be a normal way to do it. But in relativity, you can't get by just by talking about space. You actually have to talk about all of that with time. And we use a term called events for that. And just like we have an event here right now, it is at a location here at the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory, but it's also at this specific time here in uh, what would be called local proper time uh, at what we refer to as 7 p.m. is when we started. So that is a very specific event. And as we wrap things up, it'll be closer to 8. That is also a specific event uh, in general relativistic terms separated by one hour worth of time but at the same location. Nevertheless, in general relativity and relativistic terms, it's worth seeing those as two separate things because we can actually see that those two events are connected to each other. Again, we're just in one place. Everything I'm doing right now has an impact on our future, uh, and as such, everything everyone's doing in here also has an impact on that future event at the end of this talk. <clears throat> but uh, if we can actually uh, look at things in another way, that is, if we go ahead and say light can travel from one event, event to another, or rather to travel to or exceed that distance, we can really say that those two events are actually causally connected. That is, again, I can influence how things end here just by whether or not I can actually give a good presentation. So, <clears throat> along those same lines, if they can't be connected, then there's a notable thing called a horizon to that event. That is, just like we can go from seeing a place here to looking out at the distance, we can see a whole bunch of different things, but we can't see on the other side of Mount San Jacinto. That is beyond our location horizon. Likewise, an event horizon would be a matter of this event here cannot impact another event somewhere else. So anything that would mean there would be an event horizon between us. So how does that work in a black hole? Well, if you have a given radius inside which, or a radius around a particular compact object, typically referred to as a singularity, I'll come back to that later, uh, if, you, if you're actually close enough to, to that object, then you'll actually have a point where light cannot actually travel from where that event occurs to an area further away from the black hole. Thus, in between those two points, there would be an event horizon. What that actually comes out to mean, well, let's, uh, what, what that comes out to mean is it is actually a given location, and where that location is, we can actually think about it in terms of given objects, and in this case, let's go back to our black hole sun, using what's uh, uh, referred to as the, uh, the well, gotta get right, Schwarzschild radius, uh, we can actually calculate it out, and the event horizon for our black hole sun would be about uh, a sphere that's about six kilometers in diameter. So you'd have a sphere right around the center point of where the sun currently is now that's only six kilometers in diameter. Compare that to the sun's actual diameter, which is over a, well over, a, it's on the order of a, was it, a 1.3 million kilometers. So it's a notable difference in size there. <clears throat> now, this is the notable thing to actually reference. And when we're talking about a black hole, we can actually look and see how objects display Distort space-time, we can actually see the sun would do a minimal distortion. A more compact, dense object, such as a white dwarf, would uh, distort it a bit more. Granted, the size of these objects, that sphere versus that sphere, they're not to scale, by the way. But uh, a neutron star, which is an even more compact object, will di distort space-time even more. 
a black hole distorts space-time in a, such a dramatic way that we actually end up with the event horizon being a notable point well inside the gravitational pull of that object, well inside where it gets weird, uh, and that actually uh, is where you get this event horizon, which, if you cross that, that is the point where you're said to be inside a black hole. You are not to that singularity, I'll come back to that later again, uh, but <clears throat> that is a notable thing here. So, how do we actually see what's inside a black hole? Well, let's consider entering it and trying to answer that question of what is a singularity. Uh, maybe we can go inside to figure out what it is, but that's really, 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 really a bad idea. So we don't want to go inside a black hole, and here's why. Because as one appro approaches a black hole, the effects of general relativity actually become very dramatic. Uh, and as is shown on this uh, image over on the right side there, you can actually see what's called uh, gravitational lensing, it's actually bending light around the black hole there, and uh, that's not the only thing that actually happens there, because uh, while you're getting closer to an object like that, time progresses at a slower rate than it would otherwise if you were further away. Now that's not to say you will feel like you're going slower, that's not it at all. In fact, uh, if you are getting close to a black hole, you would not notice that time dilation whatsoever, but someone else further away watching you they'd be able to see a difference. And what that actually re results in, well, it results in two things. The good news is, if you're trying to head into a black hole, the good news is, you'll probably be alive well after the people further away from the black hole uh, have grown old and passed away. Bad news is, that doesn't mean you necessarily live longer, because again, time passes differently. Uh, and there's something that could happen a bit later, but I'm going to set aside actually traveling in ourselves. Let's put a box and just drop a box in, because it's much nicer to think about what happens to a box than anything alive. So, uh, close to an event horizon of a black hole, or potentially inside it, depending on the actual mass of that black hole, this object that you drop in will have different forces being pulled on either side because of the rate of change of the uh, force due to gravity. As you get closer and closer in, that force increases very, very dramatically. So if you have an extended object like this podium here, the top of it might actually have a smaller amount of gravitational acceleration downward than the bottom. What that results in is a tension between them and an overall stretching, which results in the actual technical term of spaghettification. So, uh, spaghettification would rip this thing to shreds and eventually even rip the atoms apart, so it's really something that if you really want to dispose of something like this, yeah, you throw it in a black hole, it's gone, very much so gone. But uh, it's a good reason not to go into a black hole yourself. <clears throat> so, okay, that doesn't answer the question of what's inside, it just says why you shouldn't try to travel there yourself. So, what is actually inside is, again, that increasingly curved space-time that actually gets very, very uh, dramatically uh, dramatically stretched in such a way that there might even be considered an almost, a seemingly infinite hole, an infinite pit, an infinite amount of space even that actually falls inward towards this infinitely dense object as uh, it's often referred to, the singularity. Though when we say infinitely dense and refer to the singularity, what we're talking about is it is at the actual fundamental limit of our abilities to understand what this object is. Uh, we anticipate that there are some other things going on with these objects that we still have not yet been able to figure out what it is. So, uh, it's easiest for us to actually understand and try and figure out these things from our very, very distant perspective to actually consider them this way and see whether or not our observations still match this model. Thus far, uh, well, we'll talk more about those observations later, but thus far those observations do seem to line up with treating it as this infinitely dense object. But uh, these objects do have a capability to exhibit some detectable features. Notably, we can of course figure out its mass, but that's not the only thing. We can actually figure out whether or not it has an electric charge, because uh, based on uh, what's called Gauss's law, if you draw a sphere around any electric charge, you can figure out how much charge is in there based on electric flux, and that goes for black holes as well. <clears throat> Moreover, we can actually even know its angular momentum. Even despite the fact that it is uh, essentially could be thought of as a single point, if it is rotating, uh, we can actually measure that and we would anticipate that angular momentum should be conserved, that is, the rotation of matter around a given point should really uh, be able to be detected and influence the space outside of an <clears throat> event horizon. It's weird, but it actually does work that way. 
<clears throat> but uh, really, when it comes to these objects, much of what we can expect to know would come from looking at that event horizon and trying to un understand that particular part of space. <clears throat> so, all right, where can we expect to find some of these things? Well, that's a good question, and how do we even know they exist? Well, we can really go ahead and model these things and try and figure out situations in which they would form and really try and figure out what they would do uh, around them. And one thing we would expect is to, that eventually you might have some of these objects have another object near them that might be getting torn apart and perhaps feeding these objects. <clears throat> so, uh, what would we actually expect for this type of object to fe be feeding? Well, let's... Uh, Let's go ahead and say for an object that's on the order of a number of times the mass of the sun, maybe on the order of three to about 20 times the mass of the sun, we actually might expect to find these near other stars, potentially very massive stars, and uh, they might actually be orbiting around a central uh, shared, <clears throat> shared center of mass. So they'll orbit around each other, and if they're close enough, some mass from that other bigger star, or other still alive star, rather, will be shedding mass that would fall onto the black hole. <clears throat> and again, that's the idea there. If they are close enough, you can actually have material transfer, which can actually cause some interesting features. Notably, it would look a bit like this, where you have a very uh, massive star near a very massive black hole. The material off of the star would come off of the star and move towards uh, the black hole, eventually forming what is referred to as an accretion disk. Uh, that is, matter accretes, it collects around a black hole in a notable way based on the actual general angular momentum of the entire system, it will be expected to fall into a nice plane. And as material falls in, it will collide with that, uh, that big disk and make a nice uh, impact, which actually causes it to heat up, emit certain wavelengths of light. And as it falls in, it heats up even more. And eventually, as it gets right down near the bottom, uh, right down near the black hole itself, it can actually heat up to the extent of emitting X-ray radiation. Now, Black holes are messy eaters. As that material uh, falls towards the black hole, not all of it actually enters it. Some of it gets accelerated really dramatically out the perpendicular from the accretion disk, and you get these big, giant jets. And those jets, uh, if they actually impact a lot of solar wind or stellar wind from the uh, neighboring star, can actually even emit gamma radiation uh, from that collision. So these are some things we can actually look for when we're actually looking for it. So again, <clears throat> the material itself toward in that that disk can actually be superheated and emit x-rays. So if we have an x-ray telescope, we might be able to spot some of these. And in fact, we found a number of x-ray sources, and the first one that was ever confirmed to be, or basically identified and believed to be a black hole is that of Cygnus X1, and the image you were just looking at is an artist's representation of that particular system. <clears throat> now, that particular object is estimated to have a mass of about 15 times that of the sun which is uh, notable because that means there was probably a very, very big star there before that uh, particular uh, black hole formed. Now, what does that actually mean for that? Well, there's a few other things that go on when it comes to forming a black hole, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later again, but uh, what we believe here is that this might have actually been a big star that collapsed without a violent outburst such as a uh, supernova. So, well, again, I'll come back to that. <clears throat> but we can tell that these objects exist because when we look at them, we can see exactly what's going on there. We can watch the dynamics of this binary system. Uh, and if you can look at a binary system and watch it move around, the way in which it moves around is predicted very specifically by a number of things, but even ideas dating all the way back to the, uh, really the rise of science in the era of the Renaissance to Johannes Kepler's uh, laws of planetary motion that you can actually use to weigh two different objects, and you get their combined mass from that. <clears throat> and using that and looking at the actual star that's there, we can estimate the mass of the star, thus we can also estimate the mass of what is next to it. And what is next to it being 15 times the mass of the sun and actually exhibiting properties of being extremely small indicates that it's probably not a star, therefore the best option that's left to us is something that's incredibly compact, not just a neutron star, but even more compact than that, yielding a black hole. So that's really one way we can actually get around to them. But again, this is looking at how they interact with each other, not observing it directly. So how can we actually observe them directly? Well, there's a couple of different ways. 
So far, using visible light is not the easiest one. One really notable way to do that is with gravitational waves. So gravitational waves are a notable thing. They are actually caused by two different objects moving around each other and distorting space-time. Uh, typically, it's actually done in a binary system where every given uh, uh, distortion actually propagates at the speed of light, and they are actually moving so quickly around each other that that delay actually causes the moving around them to actually, or that, sorry, that those waves cause the motion around them to decay, causing the objects to spiral in towards each other. Uh, and if they're act those distortions end up being big enough, well, maybe they'll actually be detectable. Notably, they are. And in fact, I'll let the uh, people who were really working on this originally actually talk about the very first detection of this, uh, this type of thing here. Gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein almost 100 years ago. A gravitational wave is a ripple in the fabric of space and time. It's produced somewhere in the distant universe and travels across the universe. When any massive object moves, it's changing the nature of space-time. That's what Einstein told us. So you have a motion that stretches space in one direction and compresses space in the other direction. Nobody really believed at the time of the prediction that you could ever detect them because the size of the effect is so small. It was what we call a chirp, and it was strong. Everybody thought it was a fluke, it was too good. And I thought, my God, this looks like it's it. Oh my gosh, this is, this is real. It took us 25 years and two detectors to finally detect a gravitational wave. We have interferometers, one in Hanford, Washington, one in Livingston, Louisiana, to detect the stretching and compressing of space. We literally look for changes in the space-time distance in our instruments as the gravitational wave goes by. And the gravitational wave pushes them together and apart by one one-thousandth the diameter of the nucleus of an atom. No wonder it's taken so long to pull this off. However, what's even more remarkable about this is what we detected. We have observed gravitational waves from two black holes forming a larger black hole. For the first time, two black holes spiraling together, coalescing, merging, creating wild oscillations, a storm in the fabric of space and time. They're moving at the velocity of light, damn near that velocity. 30 solar masses moving that fast. I mean, they're putting out incredible amounts of energy. And when they collide with one another, they produce a bigger black hole, but they also produce gravitational waves. And in that process, about three solar masses just disappears and goes into gravitational waves. Oh, it's going to be amazing. We have always said that this is going to be uh, a field called gravitational wave astronomy. Gravitational waves carry information that you can't get from any other way. A supernova, two neutron stars colliding, even the Big Bang itself, the beginning of the universe, all produce gravitational waves. This first detection by LIGO is the very first step. It's just the start of the story nature is about to tell us. I would love to see Einstein's face. I mean, he would have been as dumbfounded as we are, because it's a wonderful proof that all of this incredible stuff, the strong field gravity, is in his equations. Just imagine that. To me, that's a miracle. It settles the question for astrophysicists, do black hole pairs form? Yep, we got one. So, uh, two black holes actually merging together, and in case you missed it, yes, it was said that three times the mass of the sun was converted into energy just to cause those gravitational waves. Literally, the mass of the the uh, black holes themselves was converted into energy in that process. It's an amazingly huge amount of energy coming from uh, that, that actual amount of material that, again, it was 
three times the mass of the sun. I can't overstate that. There's a lot of material. <clears throat> but uh, notably, they've had a number of other detections since then. And I was actually uh, had a privilege during uh, uh, one of the American, American Astronomical Society meetings. I was actually at one of the press conferences where they uh, announced their second discovery. But LIGO's discoveries have been uh, notable for a number of reasons. And you can see that over on the side there. They tend to be actually larger than those found with X-ray studies, uh, such as Cygnus X1, that would be uh, in this group here. But LIGO's discoveries tend to be a little bit larger, and they're forming even larger black holes in the, uh, in the resulting merger. <clears throat> but this actually is a notable thing because it actually starts to fill an important gap because uh, these stellar mass black holes that we find with X-ray studies uh, tend to have a big gap between them and another entirely different group. So this actually just barely starts to fill that range that we like to refer to as intermediate mass black holes. So that's a great thing to actually note, but okay, I said there was something bigger out there. Yes, there's actually something much bigger, and they loom all over the place in the universe. These objects are uh, found typically at the centers of galaxies. These are what is called supermassive black holes. So a supermassive black hole is, again, even larger than the other ones we're talking about, and they really do hang out in the hearts of galaxies. We find them in almost every galaxy we look at, <clears throat> but uh, they are on the order of millions of times the mass of the sun. That is, take a mil like, for uh, one nearby, you might take four million uh, suns, cram them all together into one particular object, a, in particular a black hole, uh, and you would get something like these objects, but they can be on the order of a billion times the mass of the sun as well. <clears throat> and again, we find them in almost every large galaxy we look in. Anything that has any substantial structure drives, uh, is actually associated with a black hole at its center. <clears throat> but uh, it's notable that again, the first one we found was actually one in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. And again, the Milky Way galaxy is a collection of hundreds of uh, billions, uh, hundreds of billions of stars uh, and at its center, about 26,000 light years away, we found a notable radio source that uh, really ended up giving us a lot of interesting information. That radio source happened to be associated with a supermassive black hole known as Sagittarius A star. It's got an interesting name because, well, it was found in the constellation of Sagittarius, and atoms in certain uh, disciplines, they'll de be denoted as being excited with an asterisk, uh, and the astronomers were nice and excited when they found this, so they decided to call it Sagittarius A star. So they were a good, uh, exciting discovery. <clears throat> but again, the region where uh, Sagittarius A star is, unfortunately, cannot be viewed with visible telescopes because there's so much gas and dust just scattered in between us and that, that it actually uh, slowly filters out almost all of the light that comes from there. Uh, and uh, notably though, not all kinds of light pass through material the same way. Gas and dust, uh, while visible light can actually be blocked by a lot of it, certain types of infrared and other things can pass through it quite well. <clears throat> so uh, what that actually means is we can look at it in other wavelengths and really learn a lot about that environment. In fact, we can look at it and this star is actually nothing. That is a central point marked for our convenience. Everything else there is actually a other wavelengths looking at a bunch of different stars. And note the date up there, 1995. It's a little ways back there. But over time, we actually watch this same spot over and over again, and all of these stars move around that empty point in space very notably. We can actually watch them orbit around very, very particularly. And as I mentioned before, when it comes to binaries, we can measure the mass of something that is actually uh, at the center, or in, at, in, measure something that is part of a binary system. And in this case, we've got a whole bunch of different things orbiting around that particular empty spot in space, so we can weigh that empty spot in space pretty well, and that one comes out to around four million times the mass of the sun. Yes? So binary is a term used to actually reference two objects being together. It's not just uh, one, uh, the term used for any two stars orbiting around the center, uh, their common center of mass would be referred to as a binary star system. That is the, uh, the term used there. Uh, does that address your question well enough? Okay, good, good. <clears throat> so uh, when we're looking here, again, we don't see anything at that, cent at that center point there, but if we want to see it, 
Well, there are certain things we can actually do because, as I mentioned again, radio emissions are coming from that particular area. It's how we identified this area of space in the first place. <clears throat> so, we're not looking directly at the black hole, but rather material around that black hole. So, it's notable that if we could take a high enough resolution of this spot in space, we might be able to actually see a silhouette of this black hole, in particular, the event horizon there. But there's a little bit of a problem, and that is, to get that resolution, we basically need a telescope the size of the planet Earth. Uh, it's a little bit hard to do that uh, with uh, anything optical, of course, so I guess we might as well go home. Nope! No, there's actually something called the Event Horizon Telescope, which notably uses radio waves, because again, we found this first in radio waves, and radio arrays, radio telescope arrays, are used to simulate very large telescopes by actually working together using what's called interferometry to act as a giant antenna. <clears throat> so, conveniently, there are radio telescopes on a whole bunch of different places in, in, around the Earth, even in Antarctica, uh, and it's notable that it could be possible to actually make them all act together to be able to resolve this particular object. And again, there is actually a, pro a, a pro project that is working on doing this right now, and in fact, they've already taken data the question is, when will they actually make an image? I don't have an answer to that, but at the very least, I'd like to let them uh, explain their project a little bit here. Just over 100 years ago, Einstein showed how gravity could be imagined as a distortion of space-time. His equations revealed that an object small enough and massive enough could hide behind an event horizon, a point where gravity is so strong that not even light could escape. Astronomers now believe that these objects, known as black holes, exist. They inhabit the centers of almost all galaxies, where they can grow to be millions or billions of times the mass of our sun. Despite this history and growing astronomical evidence, we have never actually seen a black hole. The Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT, is the first experiment designed to capture a black hole's image. In doing so, the EHT will test Einstein's theory of gravity at one of the most extreme places in the universe, the Event Horizon. The best chance we have of taking a picture of an event horizon is the supermassive black hole at the center of our own Milky Way. Though it is 4 million times as massive as our sun, it is so far away that mapping its event horizon is equivalent to standing in New York and counting the individual dimples on a golf ball in Los Angeles. Gas falling towards this black hole heats up to billions of degrees, causing the event horizon to appear as a silhouette whose size and shape are predicted by Einstein's theory. It is best to observe this silhouette in light with a wavelength of about one millimeter, where the gas glows most brightly, and light can travel unimpeded from the center of the galaxy to telescopes on Earth. Close to the black hole, the light waves appear circular, like ripples in a pond but by the time they reach Earth, they are essentially plane waves. Imaging a black hole at this wavelength requires a telescope as big as our planet. The EHT uses a global network of dishes to simulate a telescope of this size. Each dish collects and records radio waves coming from near the black hole. The data are then combined to create the image of the event horizon. This will only work, however, if the dishes are completely synchronized. To understand this, let's use the analogy of a mirror, such as an optical telescope used for stargazing. Imagine the EHT formed from all the different array sites as one big parabolic mirror. The mirror is curved so that when a line of waves comes into the dish, they bounce off at specific angles and arrive at the focus at the same time. When the EHT sites are synchronized, their recordings can later be perfectly aligned in the same way that the mirror aligns the optical light. If the surface of the mirror is not stable, if it is vibrating, for example, the reflected light rays will not combine properly at the focus. For the EHT, an unstable mirror surface is analogous to an unstable recording. To ensure stability, the EHT uses atomic clocks that would lose only one second every hundred million years. The amount of data recorded during observations is so large that it could never be transferred over the internet. Instead, the recordings are stored on hard disks and shipped back to a central facility for processing. 
There, a supercomputer combines the data from all the sites, staggering them during playback to account for the time difference between waves getting to each telescope. The resulting data can then be used to make images with extreme magnifying power. As more dishes join the AHT, and the more widely spaced they are, the sharper our image of the event horizon will be. In April 2017, the EHT coordinated observations of the Milky Way's central black hole using a global network of telescopes. An international team of astronomers is analyzing the data, eager to bring a black hole into focus for the first time. The results could transform our understanding of black holes, gravity, and even the universe. So it's a notable thing that when you're talking about this data, they literally can't just send it over the internet. There is that much data coming off of just one of these uh, arrays or antennas. And it has a notable thing to note because, again, one of them was in Antarctica. Their observations were actually in uh, April, which April is springtime here. That means it's fall in Antarctica, and they're entering winter. They actually had to wait until the end of winter to ship the stuff out of there. So it took quite a bit of time to even just get all of that data to one place. So uh, all of that data being so enor enormous means it does take a lot of effort to actually try and process it. That is why we do not have an image yet. But we're working our way there, and I'm really hopeful that it might come sometime soon in the next year or so. Well, then we'll see. <clears throat> but uh, all this time I've been talking about black holes and everything, but I've never actually gone and addressed the question of where, the, where do they come from? I mean, it's a notable question. Every uh, young child eventually asks their mother, Mom, where do black holes come from? Yes. <clears throat> but uh, it's a notable thing to actually try and understand that. Uh, but the primary mechanism we have for understanding that is actually looking at them forming through what is called the core collapse of a very massive star. Now, a very massive star, one that is greater than about eight to 10 times the mass of the sun, that range, still trying to narrow that down to t say that exact cutoff, but uh, anything bigger than that range has sufficient mass to cause the nuclear fusion that occurs at the core of that star to not only fuse hydrogen into helium and helium into carbon and oxygen, but above that mass, you're able to fuse carbon and oxygen into a variety of different other elements, including neon and a, a number of things, all the way up until iron. Uh, and when you form iron, you reach a tipping point because fusing all the elements that are, have a lower number of protons than iron, uh, you can actually generate energy from. But uh, once you go above that, you are reached that tipping point where it costs energy to actually fuse them into larger things. So when you reach iron, you end up building up a big, massive core, and eventually one good result is that that core actually collapses under its own self-gravity. It's actually not able to hold its own structure because of the actual uh, with nuclear forces involved. It's not able to actually support itself, and they collapse inward. And what you can get out of that is either a neutron star or a black hole if it's massive enough. Now, this collapse is typically associated with certain types of supernovae, uh, typically what are called type 2 supernovae, in particular type 2 Ls and type 2 Ps and a number of others. There's a whole bunch of different subcategories. That's a whole other talk for another time. But uh, notably, <clears throat> there's been increasing evidence that not every core collapse results in a supernova. And when it comes to something like Cygnus X1 being that 15 times the mass of that, or being of 15 times the mass of the sun is in that black hole, it might actually make sense that that one didn't actually go through and explode dramatically, partly because it actually helps explain why there'd be a star so close to it. <clears throat> so uh, that's a notable thing there, but well, where do we actually see these events going on? Well, good news is uh, when it comes to recent stuff, well, we can say, yeah, typically if you actually look out, we can often find uh, black holes forming through supernovae uh, just by looking around. There's often, often somewhere in the universe we can see a supernova going on. But notably, recently, again, by recently, I mean 47 or so million years ago, uh, a star exploded in a galaxy known as M77, and the light from it began to reach Earth just one week ago. And that is an image I took last night of that galaxy. Can you see the supernova? Yeah, it's, it's notably a, a little bit difficult to notice, so let's magnify it up. It is that little blip right there. Uh, a week ago, that blip wasn't there, and that is 
the combined light of a huge ex titanic explosion that actually, uh, again, has been classified as a type 2 supernova, so it's very likely a core collapse supernova. <clears throat> but uh, when we're looking at it here, this is, again, all of the rest of this is the combined light of around uh, 300 billion stars, and that is coming from the result of one of them exploding. So that should show just how much energy is being released here. And uh, when we're actually looking at it, often a supernova can actually outshine an entire galaxy worth. So it's a notable thing to actually, a galaxy worth of stars, I should say. <clears throat> so it's a notable thing there. Uh, but uh, I would love to go uh, look at it. It turns out this object is actually really dim in the, uh, to, the visual, to visible observing. So it looks really good in the camera, not as good through the eyepiece. But it's still a nice one. But let's uh, bring it all together and actually note a few things. So when it comes to black holes, they're objects which were first predicted simply with very basic calculations. But uh, over time, we were able to develop a lot of theories that gave us an idea of what they would, quote unquote, look like. <clears throat> but uh, we've also been able to find a number of such objects and really get a uh, notable thing of trying to figure out what's going on there. And we really want to uh, see that a lot of these do exist in the centers of galaxies. So it's a really interesting seeing the variety of things there. Uh, but also in the very near future, we might have an image of these objects, which is extremely exciting. And last but not least, don't jump into a black hole. It's a bad idea. <clears throat> Thank you all, everyone, for coming out tonight. <clears throat>